Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 2021 Equity Summit. Um, this 45 minute session is Racism, a Public Health Crisis with Denise Harlow and Tia Williams. I'm Jovita with the National Community Action Partnership. And myself, as well as Johnny behind the scenes, will be here to help make sure that things go smoothly throughout this event. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself or Johnny through the chat at any point during this session, and we can help troubleshoot any technical issues you might have. Um, if you are disconnected from this uh, session, please rejoin through the link provided in, on the Equity Summit landing page. Um, you can also email registration at communityactionpartnership.com. A few more technical notes before we begin. We are recording this session to be made available to registered attendees for 30 days following the end of the event. Uh, all attendees are currently on mute. We do ask that you submit your questions and comments through the Q&A or chat function. Questions will be answered at the end of the session, so we'll be tracking those as we go forward. There is a PowerPoint for this session, and we will make sure that that is shared with all Equity Summit attendees via the event landing page and the event app following this session. And once again, your feedback is very important to us, so please do take a moment after the session or at the end of the day to complete the evaluation for this session. With that, I'm going to turn the session over to Denise and Tia. Thank you, Jovita. Hi, everyone. You're navigating the technology to the various places you need to go. So that is positive. As you heard Brian uh, mention this morning, um, the Partnerships Board of Directors and the Partnerships National Community Action Equity and e Economic Mobility Commission has declared racism as a public health crisis. The board will pass at its next board meeting, if not before, a formalized resolution stating that as well as a toolkit. And we'll be doing a webinar and things like that that will help you as local agencies, both nonprofit and public caps and state associations to work with your own municipalities, your own units of government, your own organizations. So you too can declare racism as a public health crisis. This effort has been gaining momentum across the country and I just want to give a, I mean, American Public Health Association, Tia Williams, you, you met, you saw Dr. Benjamin yesterday. APHA is leading in this space. And you'll see in the tool, in the language we use in our resolution, the tools that we put into our toolbox and our, and our toolkit come directly from APHA and others. So I'm just really excited that Tia is here with us today. You don't have to bow out, but I know you're in very good hands here. APHA is again, leading in this space. If you have questions, concerns, how does this work from a functional perspective? They have a mapping tool I'm sure she'll talk about where you can see other municipalities that have made this declaration. And we think at the partnerships office that you as local entities and state associations, we can have a voice. It's about systems change. And was it Gail Christopher yesterday or somebody else said, you know, resolutions are part of a narrative change. They may not have huge weights, but they change and accurately reflect truth. And that's what we're talking about a lot at this summit is truth telling, changing the narrative and speaking truth to power. And this kind of declaration is a great place for your organization to do something tangible and work with your governmental partners to do the same. So Tia, thank you so much for being here. Um, we so appreciate the partnership and collaboration with APHA and um, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, it's really exciting to hear that a declaration is in the works. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here today and especially want to thank the um, summit planners for inviting APHA to this timely and necessary conversation. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully you all can see that. So today we're going to talk about racism as a public health crisis. And before I get started, I also want to acknowledge um, all of the advocates, scholars, practitioners that have been dedicated to dismantling racism for decades and beyond. Um, it's 
you know, the timing for the racial rec reckoning or this version of the racial reckoning is now, but this, this work has been going on for decades and I just wanna acknowledge that. So for our time together today, we will examine the determinants of health and equity. We'll define racism and racial equity. We'll describe racism as a public health crisis. And we'll also review some tools and resources for advancing racial equity. And please do submit your questions in the chat function. Um, I will take some clarifying questions throughout, but we'll save most of the questions for the end of um, my presentation. So first we'll talk about the determinants of health and equity. And I know for some of you, this may be review, but we know that there are soci that socioeconomic factors, the physical environment and healthcare, also known as the social determinants of health account for more than 70% of our health. We also know that health status varies widely by the zip code in which you were born and are raised. So when we say the social determinants of health, we're talking about those conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. Um, and addressing the social determinants of health requires cross-sector collaboration. And the primary goal is to improve health outcomes. However, the social determinants of health alone do not go far enough for addressing equity because it often ignores how inequity which is largely driven by racism, is deeply embedded in all of our systems and structures. And in fact, addressing the social determinants without attention to equity can have the unintended consequences of widening disparities and inequities. So addressing the social determinants of equity requires that we monitor inequities and in exposures, opportunities, and disparities in outcome, that we examine structures, uh, policies, norms, and values, that we rectify historical injustice, we must distribute resources according to need, and we have to transform structures and systems of power, including racism. And in addressing the social determinants of equity, we not only aim to improve health, but to eliminate health disparities and achieve social justice. So for those of us working in public health, our goal is to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to reach their, their the opportunity to reach their optimal health. And if we believe that, then racial equity has to be seen as essential for health equity. And so what do we mean by racial equity? Um, there, I'm sure there are many definitions and one that we've adopted is a condition where one's race has race identity has no influence on how they fare in society. Race equity is one part of racial justice and must be addressed at both the root causes and not just the manifestations. And it includes the elimination of policies, practices, attitudes, and cultural messages um, that reinforce differential outcomes by race. And one critical strategy for advancing racial equity is the application of a racial equity lens. And that's the process of paying disciplined attention to race and ethnicity while analyzing problems, looking for solutions, and defining success. A racial equity lens critiques a colorblind approach, arguing that colorblindness perpetuates systems of disadvantage and it prevents structural racism from being acknowledged. So before we go any further, um, I would like to hear from you, um, all of you who are doing racial equity work. What are some of the challenges that you encountered in doing this work? And you can just enter the number um, associated with the challenge in the chat feature, and I'll read those now. Number one is the denial that racism is a problem at all. Number two, the lack of understanding of impacts of racism on health. Three, uh, resistance to the connection between racism and poverty. Um, four, lack of leadership support or champions. Five, insufficient resources, insufficient or limited resources to support the work. Six, active resistance from constituents. Seven, insufficient data to make the case. Number eight, you don't encounter any challenges or if there are other challenges that you incur in doing racial equity work. 
multitask here. You can see quite a bit of quite a few ones. Denial that racism is a problem at all. A few fours and fives around resources, leadership support. More denial, insufficient data, see that? Resistance, resistance to the connection between racism and poverty or racism and health. Denial in the rural communities. I was hoping to see a few eights, but I know that's not realistic. Unconscious bias. Challenge in implementing the changes needed to address the issues identified. Right. Well, these are all um, shared challenges that many folks encounter, and hopefully. Um, you know, that's one of the things that APHA is aiming to do is really help um, folks like you all who are doing the work to one, connect with each other, but also to help try to identify what are some of those strategies for addressing some of these key challenges um, that you are facing. So thank you all for participating in that. Um, so now I'm going to talk about declaring racism a public health crisis. And again, I think it's important to level set to make sure that we're all on the same page about just what we're talking about. And I want to acknowledge that there are many different definitions of racism. And APHA has adopted that of Dr. Kamara Jones, which is that um, and she's an anti-racism scholar and past APHA president, for those who may not be as familiar with her work. And her definition is that racism is a system. It's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how a person looks. And the result is a system that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And this last point is evident in you know, concentrated poverty. It's evident in inequities among our school systems and the lack of investments in young people of color and also in the over-policing, arresting, and incarceration of Black and Latinx boys and men especially. It's also important to recognize that racism operates on several different levels. Institutional racism is defined as the differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. Institutional racism is structural and codified in our institutions of custom, practice, and law. Personal, personally mediated or interpersonal racism is defined as prejudice and discrimination, whereas prejudice is the differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intentions of others according to their race. And discrimination is the differential actions towards others according to their race. And it's important to note that this interpersonal racism may be intent intentional or unintentional, but it includes acts of commission as well as acts of omission. And then lastly, internalized racism is defined as the acceptance of members of stigmatized races of the negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth. And it's characterized by them not believing in others who look like them and by them not um, believing in themselves. And I have to acknowledge that all forms of racism are driven by a deeply embedded false belief in a hierarchy of human value or a racial hierarchy. And that also has to be dismantled if uh, real progress is to be made. So for those of us working in, um, a, in, in this space, racism as a public health crisis is a no brainer, um, but many others need some convincing. And while there are clear definitions of what constitutes a public health emergency, a crisis is a bit more ambiguous. And I really like this framing by Dr. Uh, Sandra Galea and the team at Boston University School of Public Health, which is that a public health crisis affects large numbers of people, threatens health across the long term and requires the adoption of large scale solutions. So let's see what happens when we put racism up against this criteria. The criteria, the first criteria being that it affects large numbers of people. 
So we know that Black and Latinx community, the Black and Latinx community alone is estimated over 100 million. And we know that those numbers are, those demographics are growing and shifting. Um, that systemic issues have created concentrated poverty where one in four Black Americans and one in six Latinx Americans live in high poverty neighborhoods compared to just one in 13 of their white counterparts. There's also the opportunity and wealth gap where in 2019, the median wealth for Black and Latinx families was between 24 and $36,000 compared to $188,000 for white families. And have to note that these are all pre-COVID numbers and we know that the pandemic is widening inequities across all indicators. Um, the second criteria that uh, a public health crisis threatens health of, over the long term, well, because of this systemic racism, we have at least a five to seven year difference in life expectancy by race and ethnicity. We have higher rates of chronic disease among communities of color. And we have a black, um, a maternal mortality rate where black women are three to four times more likely to die within a year of childbirth and that rate is consistent across socioeconomic levels. And within the COVID-19 pandemic, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities are experiencing mortality and morbidity at rates much higher than their representation of the population. And I should add um, some communities within the Asian Pacific Islander community are as well. We just don't always have the data to substantiate that. And then the last criteria is that a public health crisis must require the adoption of large scale solutions. Well, racism is embedded into our systems and structures. So the solutions have to be systemic. Um, focusing on the individual has only widened inequities. So it's with this recognition um, that jurisdictions began to declare racism a public health crisis. And I think, in fact, um, the, first price, the first declaration might have been made in 2018, so I need to update this slide. But of course, um, with the events of summer 2020, with the murder of George Floyd, the um, COVID-19 pandemic, the uprising over police violence, and the movement for Black lives, in the summer of 2020, we saw a surge of jurisdictions claim, um, making these declarations. And based on our tracking, we have there are at least 190, I think right now on our map it shows 195, and we're adding new declarations every day um, of these declarations. And I'll talk a little bit more about the map. Um, many of these declarations are happening at the local level, so in cities and in counties, and a few states have made them as well. And they, um, they span different uh, legislative and um, leadership bodies at the state and local level. So APHA, as I mentioned, is tracking these declarations. And what we've seen is that there's definitely a spectrum with some being more robust than others. Um, and they have a few uh, clear requirements in a few areas that I'll just touch on briefly. So one is around data and accountability. So that includes the creation of an office group or task force for the purposes of data collection on racial inequities. And it might also include a group that is um, tasked with ensuring accountability on stated equity goals. And here are just a few examples of those that we've pulled from the declarations in Jefferson County, Colorado. Um, they aim to enhance data collection and analysis that produce a justice-informed community health needs assessment. Um, Douglas County, Nebraska establishes and supports an Office of Health Equity and Racial Justice through its um, declaration. Another area that is in a, some of the declarations, although I will say it's quite disappointing that this is not more common across the declarations, and that is around community engagement. Um, uh, DeKalb County require, uh, requires racial equity training for community partners, grantees, and vendors, and contractors. But I will say that many of the declarations are very light in how they describe how impacted communities will be engaged in and helping to lead decision-making processes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the limitations or kind of what's missing from these declarations. 
Some of the declarations focus very specifically on racial equity uh, policies and programs, and that includes promoting an equity in all policies approach for all um, future policies and programs. So for example, in Minneapolis, um, their declaration directs them to evaluate the city charter and all city policies to policies and procedures to prioritize racial equity. In Allegheny uh, County, Pennsylvania, um, their, um, their declaration explicitly men mentions advancing the Black Mamas Matter policy agenda. Another area included in many of the declarations is uh, around agency and organizational capacity. So in um, Douglas County, Nebraska, the declaration orders um, state government, uh, the county government, I'm sorry, to conduct um, all the human resources, vendor selection grant and grant management activities through a racial equity lens. And that in includes a review of internal policies of practice policies and practices around hiring and leadership appointments. Um, and in Boulder, Colorado, excuse me, um, it includes specific directives around um, expanding on their courageous conversations effort about race. Funding, so we know, um, and I saw a few um, people mention a lack of resources. So this work has to be, have the resources that include the, Include the funding, the manpower, uh, the person power, I should say, to support it. Um, and very few of the declarations have specific funding um, requests or asks. Um, in a few that I've extracted are in Boston, Massachusetts, um, an accompanying um, document to their declaration. It was an executive order, um, redirects $12 million from their police overtime funds to support equity and inclusion efforts, including funds for the Boston Public Health Commission. And in Minneapolis, their uh, declaration allocates dollars in the mayor's budget to be um, directed towards small businesses, small business development, housing, um, community-based infrastructure, um, and uh, creating a sustainable fund for youth development. So this is based on our preliminary analysis. We haven't looked at all, you know, nearly 200 declarations. Um, and this is not to say that um, these components are absent from all of the declarations, but we do see opportunity for strengthening language and actions in a few areas. So if you all are thinking about, um, you know, pursuing declarations, these are some things to keep in mind. You know, and one is as simple as defining racism. So it's striking um, how many do not include an explicit de uh, definition of racism. And so it leaves it up to a lot of interpretation. And I think, um, you know, as I mentioned before, there are many different declarations, but to the extent that you can include one that focuses on the systemic nature of racism, because I think um, our, our most people's minds go to the interpersonal. So defining racism should be a key, key component of the background information. Um, more justice-oriented language is needed, um, specifically, specifically a more explicit focus on building civic, cultural, and political power in impacted groups. Um, more language on racial healing and healing more broadly. Um, I know that the, um, that the partnership is a truth, racial healing, and transformation um, partner. And so many of you are probably familiar with that framework. Um, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that we will not make meaningful progress toward equity if we don't dress, address the deep division and trauma that exists within and between community. And that's why we have to prioritize healing. Um, and while ultimately the focus is on structural racism, we have to remember that those structures, policies and practices are upheld by people whose actions are driven by their thoughts and their emotions, um, which are guided by their beliefs and their values. I mentioned before, you know, in more uh, stronger language around community engagement and specifically around um, community-led and asset-focused solutions and how those communities will be engaged um, and help and allow to help lead decision making as it relates to um, advancing racial equity in their communities. 
Um, and then a few others, um, just more specificity around some of the agencies that need to be involved with the work um, to address the social determinants. And then lastly, you know, um, more specifics around funding and resource allocations. So this is just a summary slide um, that, uh, of some of the key components that we recommend being included in, um, in the declarations that the APHA is working on a guidance document for jurisdictions that are interested in making um, these declarations. So a question that we get all the time and some of you may be wondering or have to answer yourselves is are these declarations meaningful or just performative? And Denise spoke a bit to this as well. And we view these declarations as an important first step because they focus on systems and structures rather than dismissing inequities as just the faults of individuals, um, which just leads us down the path of um, focusing on behavioral change and not systemic change. Um, but we do also recognize that these declarations have to be accompanied by um, resources and should include ways to hold governmental systems accountable for making um, meaningful progress towards equity for people of color. But I don't wanna discount the significance and the symbolism and you know, what Den Denise was mentioning about shifting the narrative. For far too long, the United States has ignored and even diminished the existence of racism. We've skirted around using the word. Um, in the health community, we focus on the so-called biology of race as a driver of disparities and inequities. And so with making these declarations, jurisdictions are making a public and historic acknowledgement that not only does racism exist, but that it's also a major driver of health outcomes. Um, in a recent poll by RWJF, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, it included people hardest hit by, um, it found that many people, including those hardest hit by longstanding inequities, still don't see the connection and still don't see systemic racism as a barrier to good health. So these declarations can be used to highlight those connections, um, stress the urgency to support the truth telling um, that is needed for transformation. So now I'm gonna just um, talk through a few resources for declaring racism a public health crisis. Um, as Denise mentioned, APHA does have a map. We've been tracking these declarations since last summer. Um, and in February of this year, we launched this mapping tool. Um, and on the site, it allows you to see both um, broadly the geograph and geographically the spread and concentra concentration of declarations across the country. So the deeper color indicates greater concentration or number of declarations. Um, you can sort by the level of entity, whether it's at the state, city, or county level. And then you can also, um, select the type of entity that you'd like to see, whether it's a board of health, public health association, city or town council, et cetera. Um, this is just another view of the map for when you um, kind of zoom in. Um, when you click on a state, you can see the geographic points within the state that have declarations. Um, on the side, you can see that um, a, a sidebar pops up with a total number of declarations within a state and a list of the declaring entities. And wherever available, we link to the declarations language itself. And this is the last screenshot I'll show of this. Um, it just kind of shows you what happens when you actually click on or hover on a specific um, point. And I'll just also note that we are in the process of building out the web page to include some analysis of the declarations and um, including resources that will help um, state, lo states, localities, and communities with the development and implementation of these declarations. Another resource I wanted to highlight is Salud America, who is also um, tracking these declarations, and they have an action pack um, that includes model emails and talking points to start the conversation for a resolution. Um, it had shareables for um, social media messaging around it and a number of other um, key things that could be helpful as you're building momentum and support um, for a declaration. And then I will close out um, by just sharing a few other resources for advancing racial equity. Um, APHA in the summer of 2020 launched a, an Advancing Racial Equity webinar series. 
this six part series focused on racism as a driving force for the social determinants um, and examines both historic and present day impacts of racism across um, housing, policing, reproductive justice, racial healing and environmental justice. And um, we just about a month ago released an updated discussion guide that accompanies the series. Um, and it is, the discussion guide is to be used in conjunction with viewing the webinars. It includes a summary of each webinar, pre-webinar questions and post-webinar discussion questions and activities. Um, and you know, it's primarily designed for public health students and pr practitioners, but it can be used by anyone who is interested in having meaningful discussions about racism and racial equity. So as I mentioned, we just released an update to the guide and you can now earn up to nine continuing education credits for the webinar series. And I can't believe this is the first time I'm saying this, but you will have access to these slides um, so you can see, um, can get to the website links. Um, APHA also has a book, Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional. It's intended for uh, use in a wide range of settings, including health departments, schools, and in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors where public health professionals work. And this is something that you can also earn, earn continuing education credits for. I'm um, moving on to a few non-APHA resources. Um, the Awake to Woke to Work, Building a Race Equity Culture Tool from Equity in the Center. Equity in the Center is a great tool for assessing organizational culture and readiness for racial equity work. So at the AWAKE stage, it's really focused on people and the primary goal is diversity. At the WOKE stage, it's focused on culture and um, the primary goal is inclusion. And at the WORK stage, this is where it really becomes institutionalized and integrated. Um, and that is just that the goal of that is just that the integration of a racial equity lens into all aspects of an association or organization. And so I'm going to turn back to you now. Um, where would you say your organization is on the spectrum of building a race equity culture? Are you in the awake phase, woke phase, work phase, or not on the spectrum? If you want to enter that into the chat now. Missing work. Work, lots of awakes. Quite a few wokes coming in. Moving from woke to work. In the work phase, I like to see that. <laughs> Need to get to work. I hear that. Excellent. Not on the spectrum, but you're moving them on to it. Excellent. Glad that you're here. So in the essence of time, I'm going to move on a little in the woke stage. So here's another tool. This was actually created by a, a, a group of APHA affiliates. So we, are, for those who are not familiar, APHA has 53 state and regional public health affiliate associations. Um, and they recognize that um, diversity, equity, and inclusion were huge challenges, particularly with the leadership of those, of those associations and they're not necessarily being representative of the communities that they serve. Um, and so they developed this um, self-assessment toolkit, which is available at the link in the, um, on the slide. Um, it's primarily uh, geared towards nonprofit organizations with a volunteer board of directors and a small staff, I would say three to five staff, because um, they acknowledge that these organizations are generally community-based with limited uh, resources. Um, but this is a really helpful tool um, for um, doing a, a level of self-assessment in a small um, organization. 
Um, this is Dr. Kamara Jones' framework for assessing how racism is operating in any space. You can use this within an organization, within a department, within a program, within um, your leadership. Um, and the idea is to assess how racism is offering in uh, operating, sorry, in structures. So that's the who, what, when, and where of decision making. So the questions you might ask is, you know, what is the composition of our board? Is there diversity among the leadership? Does the leadership reflect the community served? Um, looking at the policies with the written how of, uh, you know, decision making and operations within a within a, an organization or group. Um, the questions you might ask um, to assess this are, is there alignment of organizational policies and stated values and mission? Um, are there inherent biases within um, those policies? And is there transparency around how policies are made and enforced? Practices and norms are the unwritten how. So you might assess who is leading anti-racism or racial equity works. Is it predominantly falling on the people of color in, in an organization? Um, is the practice of uh, racial equity ongoing and embedded across the organization and are there systems for accountability? And then lastly, you would assess the values, which are the why. Um, and the question that you, uh, may come up um, in this assessment is, is there a hierarchy of valuation by race or ethnicity, um, work role, education level, or discipline. So that's another tool that we um, recommend, and we actually have it in a few times um, in our discussion guide as it relates to different topic areas. And then I just wanted to highlight a few racial equity resources. There are so many. This is not by any means an exhaustive list. Um, these are a few that um, we point people to quite a bit and some of them you may already be familiar with. The Racial Equity Tools is a comprehensive site that includes over 600 resources as it relates to tools, research, tips, and curricula. Um, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, um, their Getting to Results uh, product is developed to assist jurisdictions in using a racial equity lens. Um, many of you might be familiar with the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Implementation Guidebook. And then lastly, um, and a lot of those things are kind of focused on um, both internal capacity building and external uh, policies and programs. Um, the Blueprint by Change Lab Solutions, um, the Blueprint for Change Makers, presents um, legal strategies and best practices to help policymakers and communities improve health outcomes, and it provides a roadmap for working locally and collaboratively to advance laws and policies that will help to ensure that everyone has a fair chance to live a healthy life. And so with that, um, here's my com uh, contact information, and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you so much. So Tia, we actually do have uh, a few questions that have already come in. And for folks who were holding their questions, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and putting those in the chat. The first question we received was about police departments. Are they made aware of the declarations as soon as they're enacted? How are they engaged? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know the extent to which that connection is being made at every level. I do, I will say that many of the declarations obviously grew out of frustration and acknowledgement that the, the system of policing is one, one in which racism is deeply embedded and it has such a severe impact on Black and Latinx, Black uh, communities especially. Um, so I can't speak to um, how quickly um, they are notified. What I do know is that the folks who are leading the charge and getting these declarations passed are, um, are, are, are leading the work in terms of um, holding the various governmental systems accountable for, um, for what's in the declaration. Thank you. Uh, our next question was, when do you measure um, how well communities are doing to make measurable or significant or 
just progress in general on addressing racism as a public health issue. Um, when or how do we know if uh, a locality or a state is just giving lip service and mm -hmm. acknowledgement rather than modifying systems that create barriers? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think one, this is where or there's obviously kind of more formalized data collection around you know, health and health outcomes, but that also takes time and takes years to be able to see trends over time. But I think this is also where engaging the community becomes critically important because if you are you have those relationships with the community members and they trust, you know, trust you they're gonna be honest. They're gonna be honest about what they see. Um, and so I think having mechanisms um, for ongoing engagement with the communities, having opportunities for the communities to provide buy-in and not just buy-in, but also leading the development of solutions are ways in which you can engage in the interim, um, whether or not progress is being made. Awesome. Our next question, um, to what extent are individual municipalities, counties, or other jurisdictions learning from or following one another in terms of practices and implementation? Hmm. That um, I will say is, um, is a critical component of this work, starting with the declarations. I mean, you, you will see after you look at a few of them that, oh, they just copied and pasted this from another one and changed a few things. Um, but that peer-to-peer um, -peer learning is something that organizations like APHA, like um, the, the the partnership, I'm sure, um, and others are helping to facilitate because, I mean, we're at the national level and we really, you know, and I will speak specifically to APHA, we focus more on federal level policy. So however we can be a conduit for facilitating those partnerships and those um, learning opportunities between other um, jurisdictions, we do so. Um, I know many of our partners, like the Association for State and Territorial health officials, they convene um, various state officials um, in various types of learning collaboratives, the National Association for City and County um, health officials, I know they do the same. So I think there is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think to the extent that we can help to pair um, jurisdictions that have similar demographics, similar challenges, similar um, political climates, that's what we aim to do because the challenges that I would face in Boston, Massachusetts would be very different from Omaha, Nebraska. And so um, there are, you know, I think what's really interesting about the declarations when you start to look at them at a more granular level, I mean, I actually just heard this um, on Monday, um, is that St. Petersburg, Florida has been trying um, to pass a declaration unsuccessfully, but a neighboring county that's very similar has passed this has been able to pass one. So putting those two groups in touch with each other so that they um, can talk about how uh, they kind of navigated those challenges to be successful is a key part of what APHA and our partner groups see as our role in this work. That's awesome in terms of making those connections there. Um, we do have a participant that notes that their city just determined it will review its charter with an eye towards equity. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a list that you're aware of uh, of other cities that have specifically identified this as one of their action items? Um, any info or resources, um, sample charters? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that are in the works. I know a couple of, uh, at least one partner organization is working on a model declaration and that should be available very soon. As I mentioned, APHA is developing what we call, we call a guidance document. Um, and um, I think there are a number of different, there are a number of different um, groups that have tracked um, organizations or as jurisdictions that are you applying a race equity lens and are embedding consider considerations of equity across governments. Um, if you can email me, then I can send you links for a couple of groups that have done just that. I don't know how extensive the lists are, but I can at least point you towards some that have um, that are tracking and monitoring um, jurisdictions and how they are embedding considerations of race and equity into their work. Thank you.
Um, and you've you've talked a bit about this, but maybe if you could expand upon it. Um, the question raised is, are these crisis declarations specific to Black communities, um, the communities in which they're declared? Um, are they meant to characterize the entire municipality, county, or state? Um, and maybe if you could share again that what they're just talking about, that well, the question is around examples of um, places where declarations have made a substantial impact. Mm -hmm. So in terms of substantial impact, I think it's too early to tell. Um, many of them were just um, implemented or passed within the last year. One of the things that we're really interested to see and you know, um, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do some analysis is whether or not um, those are kind of earlier adopters if that had any impact on their COVID-19 response, particularly their the vaccine um, rollout and distribution. We have not done that analysis, but it's something that we're interested in monitoring. And I think that could be an immediate uh, kind of point to seeing how much legs, how many, how much legs are actually to these declarations and whether people are actually walking the talk. Um, the first part of the question, remind me, Jovita. Sorry. Just you no, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, so just related to and you spoke a bit about this, um, whether it was specific to black or African Americans oh, yes. or mm -hmm. so um, some of the declarations do specifically call out in their background section black lives matter um, efforts to end police violence. Um, but they, and some are very specific, but many of them are brought to communities of color. Um, but they also do recognize that there is anti-Black sentiment throughout communities. Um, but I would say um, it would be interesting to see if some of the more recently adopted declarations are um, more specific around anti-Asian American um, sentiment, given that that's gotten more um, kind of national uh, attention recently. Um, so I would say some do. Some go as far as acknowledging the historical injustices by all communities of color, and some are narrow, but I would say that the ones that are narrow are, um, are fewer, and some of them don't mention specific communities at all. Thank you. I think that was very helpful for folks. Um, I'll do one more question before we're, we end. We're at time, but this is actually a broader question around um, public health, substance abuse, abuse, the opioid crisis, um, and how all of those pieces might connect to this um, or uh, other mm -hmm. efforts by APHA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the substance abuse and opioid crisis is a really interesting one while we're talking about systemic inequities. And I think anyone who's working in that space notes the disparity in, in um, resources and attention to the opioid crisis versus um, you know, um, substance abuse issues in communities of color. Um, I think that these declarations and the broader work around racial equity that's happening in localities can absolutely um, be used as a launching pad for having um, for addressing those crises, crises more specifically with a racial equity lens. So I think when you know these declarations and other things like that, because I, I don't think I said this in my presentation, it's important to acknowledge that there are many jurisdictions that are and have been doing this work and do not have a declaration, but they may have an even broader um, piece of legislation or initiative that has more legs to it, is more robust, has been in implementation for years. Um, and you know they may not see the need for a declaration because they've already been doing the work. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. But I think you know these declarations can really be used to help hold government governmental systems accountable for addressing a, an array of um, disparities and inequities. Thank you so much, Tia, for joining us. Um, just a note to the attendees, uh, we'll begin again at 2.30, and the next session is a general session. Just a reminder to go back to the event landing page, and we'll place that in the chat, um, and you'll use the link there to join us again at 2.30. Take care.